my name is Maurice de Klein. I'm a researcher from the Spatial Information Laboratory Vrije Universiteit Amsterdam. And unfortunately, I cannot be here today since I'm away. I'm in Australia together with my wife enjoying a nice road trip. So I made a video instead. The title of this presentation is Simulating Land Use Change for the Lower Rhine Mules Delta in the Roman Period. And I'll be telling something about this through several steps. First, I will tell something about the theoretical context on landscape simulations, which will be followed by an introduction uh, to the modeling framework. That will be followed by an application of the modeling framework in two cases, which is followed by challenges and limitations of it and some concluding remarks. So the theoretical context on landscape simulations. We, we identify two different approaches on uh, landscape simulations, of which the first one is the essentialist approach, of the landscape, they see the landscape more as a physical fact and determining factor for the location of settlements, and it's rooted in the ecological domain. And the other approach that we identified is the more constructivist approach uh, of the landscape, who sees the landscape more as a hermeneutic entity and looks at the people that shape the environment by adapting their technologies and projecting their values and beliefs. And we identified a gap between the two of them. This gap we're not the first one, we're not the only one who identified this gap. It has been identified by multiple archaeology scholars um, for which they applied agent-based modeling and all kind of um, 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 simulation methods and techniques. Um, however, one of the striking things is that the sociological simulation component remains one of the major challenges and we aim through this research to contribute to that specifically. So the current paper proposes a modeling framework in which sociological and biophysical processes are integrated to generate a better understanding of past spatial dynamics and land use, on land use. And we really see this as an heuristic tool to test hypotheses uh, and to support theory building as well. So the core of this modeling framework that we applied exists of two components. So the first one is the demand for land use and the other one is the suitability for land use. To determine the demand and the suitability, we applied a conceptual framework which is derived from contemporary studies of agricultural systems. And for the demand, we identified socioeconomic factors and cultural factors, such as demography, demand for commodities, diet, tradition, and religion. Those provide us with the information for the demand. And on the other hand, we have the suitability, technological factors, spatial environmental factors, and political factors. So political factors, think of ownership, uh, territories, political influence. Spatial environmental factors, think of physical characteristics of the landscape, distance relationships, site catchment, all those kind of stuff. And technological factors, we place them deliberately in the middle. Uh, think of tools, agricultural systems, and building techniques. We place them deliber deliberately in the middle because uh, in other contexts they might also influence the demand. However, in our current story, we didn't do that, so we made it into a dotted line, but the conceptual framework does include that. And the demand and the suitability combined, they are put into our allocation, land use allocation procedure, which will produce uh, simulation outcomes uh, according to different scenarios which are uh, identified in the different factors. So we applied this model um, for the Lower Rhine region by looking specifically to uh, a really nice research presented by Marike van Dinteren and Laura Koistra recently. Um, and they raised the question, they focused at the Roman period from AD 40 to AD 140, and they asked themselves the question, could the local population of the Lower Rhine Delta supply the Roman army? And their main conclusions are that the local population would have been able to produce enough surplus to sustain the Roman army, so producing enough food. However, they assumed in their, um, they, they made a, a, a big assumption that stood out uh, that 50% was imported of the cereals. And we have focused on that. We have checked uh, on that, uh, whether or not this figure is really feasible and if the landscape can really uh, produce such, uh, such an amount. The second thing that they concluded is that all wood was obtained locally. Uh, and we have been looking at that particular uh, um, uh, statement hypothesis as well. So Marike van Dinter and Laura Koester, they divided the landscape in three 
uh, three sub-regions, uh, the Western Coastal Region, the Central Peat Area, and the Eastern River Area. And they identified four land use, land use types uh, within, the, within this area. The first one is woodland for timber and fuel. The second one is arable farming for the production of cereal. The third one is pasture to produce meat and dairy. And the last one are meadows to produce, produce hay for cattle. Interesting to notice and interesting to stress here is that arable farming, pasture and meadow are land uses that are simulated and that will grow. Whereas woodland instead, it will be have a starting position and it will, uh, and it will have a decline because more wood is used and the wood will be, um, will be, will be, uh, and the areas will be deforested. So Van Dinter et al, they produced extensive calculations on the need, on the demand for certain land use types, for certain commodities such as food, cereal and wood. Um, and they uh, translated that into an area that would be, have been needed. And they confronted that with paleogeographical units to see if the landscape has sufficient land available. And looking at this table, looking at this slide, they concluded based on this that there was enough land available and that the local population could indeed meet the demand for land um, that was uh, required with this new coming Roman soldiers and Fiki inhabitants. So looking here, for instance, at AD 70, the Western coastal region, they have here a figure for available land for the different paleogeographical units. And they have a figure for the demand for the area that will be required. Looking at all these figures and going closely through them, you will find out that there was indeed enough land available for these different land use types in these different areas. The same accounts for AD 140. Although there's less land available, still there is enough land available for these various land use types. So there's obviously can be a lot of critique on the research that they published. There's a lot of assumptions made in their calculations, uh, which can be debated and has been debated by other archeology span scholars. However, um, we are not gonna touch that. Uh, we will just be focusing on if we would be applying our modeling framework uh, to their results and their figures, uh, do we come to the same conclusions? So uh, we will do that by including spatial relationships and competition for land use in the model. They didn't do that. Um, however, uh, you cannot obviously do everything in one study and we could never have done this without their study. So a lot of, uh, um, a lot of thumbs up for their study and for their extensive uh, uh, calculations. Otherwise we would never have been possible. Well, we would never have been able to apply our model in this context and to test their hypothesis. So we really see this as an extension of their work. Um, and one of the things that we found in particularly really interesting is one of the assumptions that stood out and is assumed to have a significant impact on the calculated demand for land use is that they stated that 50% of the cereals consumed by the Roman soldiers and Fiki inhabitants consisted of locally produced cereal. Um, and the rest is assumed to be imported. So since this figure has a huge impact, we uh, have um, uh, configured our model as such that we played around with this figure uh, in steps of 10%. To determine the suitability for land use, we identified several components. The first one is the physical suitability. So we looked at the paleogeography and we, based on that, we simulated a woodland based on the yield and we had a physical suitability score being given by expert judgment in a meeting. Um, so we gave uh, um, areas that are really suitable for arable farming uh, a score of five, which are less suitable uh, a score of three or two or even zero when they are completely unsuitable. We did that for arable farming, pasture and meadow. Another component to determine the suitability for land use are distance relationships. So we made a, a friction model, but based on a friction model proposed by Mark Groenhuizen, uh, combined with uh, settlement data, we had around settlements, uh, site catchment areas of one hour walking distance or one or two hour walking distances. And we applied that to the different uh, land use uh, types identified. Another thing we included are buffer analysis, simply buffer analysis around military structures. There's this assumption that wood has been cleared away for 300 meters around um, 
around uh, watchtowers and Roman uh, fortresses, castella. Um, so we included that rule as well into our model. Another thing is that political factors have been included, especially for AD 140, where there's this assumption that north of the River Rhine, north of the Limes, let's say, uh, no uh, arable farming, uh, no, no, no surplus was obtained from, or no wood was obtained from, and that everything was obtained south of the Limes um for for the roman uh, uh presence so we included that as well and we did this for we made these layers for the physical suitability no, for the suitability of land use for the different time frames for the demand for land use we looked at the local population we looked at the roman army how much cereal do they need how much wood would they need for fuel and timber and we uh, f especially looked at the import of cereal and we had these steps of 10%, so cereal, uh, so 0% of import, 10% uh, of import, 20, etc., etc., until 100%. And we formulated different scenarios out of it. So here is the, so, so, so here we identified different scenarios for it. We did it for three periods. In total, we come to 11. Uh, scenarios per period uh, times three because we have three periods and times four because we have four regeneration simulation approaches which i will be discussing later on which has a total of 132 scenarios which we applied so looking at the outcome looking at the results this is a figure these are maps on how it would look like uh, this is 50% cereal import, that's an assumption. And this is according to the wood, no regeneration of woodland scenario. Um, and you see for 80, 40, 80, 70, and 80, 140, you see the area slightly being more occupied and more and more being uh, deforested as well. Um, however, uh, if you really want to see, and if you want to have a closer look on the details on what's going on, we have, um, we have looked at the different percentages and we have looked at the ratio on which the different paleogeographical units are are um, um, are divided for the different land use types. So here we see, for instance, and this is quite interesting to see, here you see on the y-axis you see the area of uh, the different land use types. Here you see the different land use types according to the different scenarios, so 0% 0 of import uh, of, of, of local production, I must say, 10% of local production, 20 until 100. And what you can see here, for instance, it's quite uh, straightforward. You have arable farming. The more the local production, the, the, the local population must produce, the more uh, uh, arable farming you will see. You see a decline here in, um, in, in pasture, and that's logical because... Um, um, we have included in the model that uh, you have a rotation system uh, in arable farming where you would have uh, half of the land being fallow and the other half being used. Um, and those fallow lands are used for pasture, so you see an automatic decline on the uh, pasture as well. Um, but the interesting things that you see when you do this, uh, for this, uh, for, for, for the previous one, it was quite straightforward. But for this one, we see some interesting things because we see here that especially uh, when uh, arable farming is, uh, uh, when, when, when there's more arable farming than you see for pasture, you see that it is uh, declining and that the most decline uh, takes presence at the moderate levees and low levees and that basically the ratio of uh, pasture is more on the floodplains instead of the uh, levees, and that's quite interesting to see whether or not that's whether or not that is archaeologically also sound as well. So this is also a direction um, 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 to think of, and one of the results that we gain. Another thing that I want to stress in this one is more uh, um, is also quite interesting is that you see when uh, arable farming uh, for 80, 140 on the central peat area, when there's more arable farming for these different scenarios, uh, you will see that uh, especially uh, the, 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 the peaty soils will be used for arable farming as well. It can be questioned whether or not people actually did that. Uh, it will be interesting to check that with archaeological evidence. For the Western coastal region in AD 140, 
we see that the dunes are really used for arable farming. That's also a question, uh, of course, we know archaeologically that dunes were used, but uh, looking at the extent to which uh, dunes were used, um, it is interesting to reevaluate the archaeological data and to reevaluate whether or not this is also sound and this is, uh, this is realistic. Um, so it gives us a way to think and to um, uh, so, so the modeling output gives us a way of thinking and gives us gives us some information uh, on uh, theory building as well. So um, looking at the physical aspects of the landscape, we can conclude that everything will fit and that uh, there will be enough land available for arable farming, nest, uh, uh, um, meadow and pasture. Besides the physical characteristics of the landscape, we have also looked at the labor force. In this slide, you can see per period and per um, st study subregion the amount of labor that people from the settlements could, could deliver. Um, we used a figure of 25.6 hectare, hectare per settlement, and we did it uh, times the number of settlements. If you look at this slide, you can see that for 8040, there's no limitation of the labor force and there were enough men, enough people to work on the lands to produce enough cereal for the, uh, for the Roman army and Vicus inhabitants. If you look at 8070, we see that especially in the uh, central peat region, um, we see a limitation of 30%, uh, um, we see a limitation already appear at 30%. The same thing accounts for AD 140 for the western coastal region in the south and the central peat region in the south as well. However, we must say that the model has subdivided the, the, the regions really strictly, meaning that uh, the model doesn't take into account that people from other regions where there's assumed to be, have been enough labor force would have traveled to work on the lands of their neighboring uh, rural settlements. To conclude, the landscape does not seem to have been the limiting factor for supplying the Roman army. To a limited extent, the labor force does seem to be the main limiting factor, especially for AD 140. However, when confronting the simulated locations of the land use types with the paleogeographical units, interesting leads for re-evaluating the archaeological evidence are revealed. Such as, is there any archaeological evidence for ditches in the PT area? What was the extent of irrigation systems? Have these been found in the dune areas as well? Those are the questions that can be asked when you relook at the uh, when when you look at the outcomes of the modeling framework, in which which you can relook at your archaeological evidence. So there's this interaction between the two of them. So this really gives us an idea how this modeling framework can be used as an archaeological research instrument uh, to formulate to test hypotheses and to formulate theory. So the second thing that we have looked at is the statement that has been made by Van Linden et al. is that the wood has foremost been collected locally. And we have done that by defining various wood regeneration scenarios. Uh, because in doing so, we are capable of testing the feasibility of this hypothesis. So for the amount of wood, we looked at uh, the figures that have been proposed by Van Linden et al. For the various wood regeneration scenarios, we have identified two strands. The first one is occupied landscape versus a tabula rasa, and the second one is full regeneration versus no regeneration. So let me first focus on occupied landscape versus tabula rasa. So the tabula rasa situation is, and I've already been mentioning that before, that you have a starting situation of wood, and in the tabula rasa situation you have the area where wood would be possible is completely filled with wood and you would have the settlements being dropped over there and these settlements can be using the wood that is obtained around them. That's a, 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 a kind of unrealistic maximum uh, uh, scenario, whereas in the occupied uh, landscape uh, the wood has already been removed in the previous sleep period around the settlements and have been replaced by other land use types and not making the wood that is obtained from these 
woodland areas that have been replaced by other land use types being useful for that particular simulation. For the regeneration of wood scenarios, we identified uh, two strands, whereas the first one is once it is removed, it will never grow back. The second one is that wood will regenerate in cycles of 10 years and that it will fully regenerate. And obviously those two approaches of regeneration of wood are, are both not realistic. However, we do know that the truth is somewhere in between. So we use a bandwidth of scenarios. So looking at the results and looking at when we model these different scenarios, um, we get a figure like this. We get a picture like this. And this is, for instance, for AD70, 50% serial import. And we have no regeneration of wood over here. You can see that there's more wood present, especially um, at the, 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 yeah, the, that there's a, a lot of wood present still in the central peat area, but not that much wood in the eastern river area. Whereas in the full regeneration si simulation, we see that there's still some wood left in the eastern river area. So looking again at uh, the figures and confronting the areas where wood has been removed from for the from which paleogeographical units the wood has been removed, we see for AD 40, we don't see uh, a really high demand for wood. Um, and the demand for wood is this uh, black line that you see in the middle here. Um, but you see that there's more wood being, uh, that there's more areas being deforested uh, than actually was required. And that's obviously because of the uh, other land use type that are pushing basically the wood away. So areas are deforested uh, for that. So this is just to give you an example on how that looks like. In the central peat area, uh, we see for AD 70, uh, we see the following, and for AD uh, 140, we see the following over here. And I must say that I stretched the um, the, 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 the X um, axis, I just discovered that they were not on the same scale, so I stretched them a little bit so you can see uh, the differences a bit better. Um, so what we see over here in the central peat area is that the areas that are deforested are foremost uh, of, of, on the moderate levees and the low levees. And you see in the central peat area in AD 140, you see that uh, more wood is obtained from eutrophic areas. And that's really interesting because what we, what we can conclude from here is that in AD 140, they would be obtaining wood from a lesser quality. And that's really important because um, that wood would have been mostly suitable for fuel and for uh, as, as, as an energy source, but not as useful for the for construction uh, purposes. So looking at this, we can already conclude that the quality of the wood was lesser and that it might be questionable whether or not people would still be obtaining uh, wood locally if you would not have the high quality of wood that you would need for construction purposes. Um, just to show you a bit more on uh, these uh, gray lines that you see over here, because of the wood regeneration goes in cycles of 10 years, in these simulations you see a lesser areas being deforested. However, the wood produ production is obviously be higher because of these cycles of 10 years. So if you would project them here, you can see that these uh, gray lines that they stand higher so that uh, you would uh, be able to get more uh, um, wood than is requested through the demand. Uh, and here you see that even way higher than uh, in the picture to our left. Um, if we look at the eastern river area, we see uh, especially here for the no regeneration in an occupied landscape, we see that uh, the wood doesn't meet the demand anymore. So in that case, the area is already completely deforested and there's a shortage of wood, basically. Um, but that's obviously a maximum uh, scenario. We see that for the... Um, for the uh, no regeneration tabula rasa, that there's still some wood left um, in 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 the in the eastern river area for eighty seventy, but we don't see that anymore present uh, in the uh, in in the eastern river area in eighty uh, one hundred and forty. So again, I've stretched it up a bit. You can see it over here. There's no wood left anymore, 
Um, and we see here that it still produces enough wood, but there is a decline based on the uh, on the percentage of import of cereal. So you can see here, you can conclude here that um, uh, the, the forest area is declining. And if you would even be producing more arable farming that you get at the tipping point where there would not be enough wood available anymore that can still meet the demand uh, even in the full regeneration scenario. However, looking at this, in the full regeneration scenario, it still seems that there is enough wood available uh, locally uh, to be used. However, you can obviously question the quality of the wood that has been uh, um, obtained uh, from the area. So the results from the wood case does show the most significant differences between the no regeneration and full regeneration simulations. That's not really surprising. Um, and the model shows that over time, the wood is increasingly obtained from PT areas, mesotrophic and eutrophic areas and barrier plains. And this trend can especially be seen in the Western coastal region and in the central peat area for AD 70 and AD 140. And that's really interesting because the areas from where this wood is obtained um, are considered to produce a lesser quality of wood. And it is very unlikely that those are suitable for construction purposes. And this hypothesis, these outcomes are supported by the recent study published by Van Lanen et al. 2016, uh, in which they studied uh, dendrochronological, in, this, in which they performed a dendrochronological analysis um, and, and uh, show that the wood found in the Lower Rhine region origins from areas in Belgium and in Germany. So combining their results with our results, we can conclude that the import of wood has likely have been taken place on a, on a relatively large scale. So both cases, the food and wood, they uh, form a case in the direction of an economic system in which import was very prominent. And the study underlines the importance thus of the research performed by Mark Groenhuizen and Philip Verhagen and by Van Lane, who focus on travel routes and transport networks. And of course, there's a lot of limitations to our approach. Um, and this is, I think, the most fullest slide with the most words, but I want to point out some of the points here because we have uh, the modeling framework is based on a lot of assumptions. And we also suffer from different choices that we made. We suffer from edge effects. We suffer from not distinguishing different types of rural settlements. We suffer from not making a distinction between the harvest of timber and the harvest of fuel. Um, we have not included transport networks. We have not extensively researched the balancing of all these different factors. However, what I want to stress here uh, is that the model holding framework that we are proposing does uh, uh, aid us in formulating, in, in testing different hypotheses. And it's, and it's just one step that we took now um, uh, to contribute to that. So we do see an added value here uh, and it's obviously all these limitations that we see, I want to see them as challenges and opportunities to extend the model and to work uh, um, and, 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 to, uh, form and to form and to formulate future research to be integrated. Concluding the PLUS modeling framework has demonstrated how you can integrate socioeconomic processes and has indicated the value of including these various factors. And the PLUS modeling framework has shown its potential as an heuristic tool to aid in testing hypotheses and to formulate theories. So we were capable of answering questions and to posing uh, interesting things which makes us reevaluate the archaeological evidence, provide us a new research instrument which you can use to pose different questions and to answer uh, and to test different hypotheses. So I want to end this presentation with a final slide and with a quote from Wobst, who says that there are few archaeologists with the skills to build a simulation model that addresses a genuinely interesting possible explanation and even fewer with the expertise to critically assess their own models and those of others. I partly agree with Wobst. However, I think the strength and the solution lies in collaborating with archaeologists with different specializations. Thank you for your attention. I hope you enjoyed and liked my presentation. 
Um, I hope we can meet in the future. If you have any questions, please ask them via email. However, I must say that I will be back for my road trip at the end of February. So I will probably be answering your email in the beginning of March. And obviously, uh, hopefully, uh, really soon the academic article will be published. So thank you. <laughs>